everybody, and welcome to Dry Eye Happy Hour. I'm Rebecca at the Dry Eye Foundation, and Dry Eye Happy Hour is a discussion forum that we've been hosting off and on since 2020 for people living with ocular service diseases. We talk about all different aspects of the disease journey, medical topics like today's, but also we get into practical and financial and emotional and you name it, dry eye topics. It's all about pooling our knowledge and our perspectives and coming away with some very real, very practical, actionable insights. So today's happy hour topic is tear care, which is a medical device and a treatment process for people with meibomian gland disc. It is the first of its kind that we've had. I'm pretty excited about it. So besides the two of us at the foundation, we've got two patients and two doctors and an executive and a scientist from Sight Sciences, which is the company that makes tear care. Now our dry eye happy hour tradition for um, intros is for panelists to introduce themselves by sharing their name and what state they're in, what they're drinking, what their favorite non-prescription eye drop is, if they have one, and how long they've had dry eye and what the cause was, if they know. Uh, but not all of our panelists today are patients. So those who aren't will share something else about themselves that will help us understand their perspective on our tear care topic today. So I'll go ahead and start with myself. I'm Rebecca. I'm in Western Washington. It's only three o'clock here, so I'm drinking sparkling water with grapefruit juice and fantasizing about vodka because yeah. I seem to do these video things a lot. The truth is I'm an introvert that's not that comfortable behind cameras. Um, my current favorite eye drop is the Evesia nighttime gel, oh. which I've switched back to recently because the air here has just been pretty smoky for quite a while. During the day, I don't really use drops much because I wear scleral lenses, but I sometimes dribble a little saline over my lenses. Uh, next, Aiden, who serves as my co-executive director now at the foundation. Aiden? Hi there. Yeah, my name is Aiden Moore. I'm in Paulsville, Washington right now. Um, I'm looking at like four screens at once, so I'm excited to turn my camera off and just get to listen. Um, if I'm drinking anything, it'll be water, and I don't really use eye drops, so I can't can't say much on that question. Hey, thanks, Aiden. Thanks. Mandy serves on the foundation's board, and she's joining us today as a dry eye patient who has undergone tear care treatment. Mandy, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, I'm Mandy Mott. I'm on the board of the Dry Eye Foundation. As Rebecca said, I live in Madison, Wisconsin, and it is five o'clock here, so I'm having some Silk and Spice 2019 red blend. Nice. Um, I always seem to be the only one drinking on these things like alcohol, but I am from Wisconsin. So, <laughs> I mean, enough said. Um, I just started using the Avizia nighttime as well um, at night and I like it. Um, but during the day, I'm switching back and forth between Refresh Plus and then Optase. Dry eye intense drops right now. Just ordered a few more from the shop that I haven't tried before. So always trying new ones out. I've had dry eyes since I was 19. I'm 46 now, and we don't know why. Mine are aqueous deficient and MGD. Hey, thanks, Randy. Next up, Lynette, a community member who has had tear care treatment as well. Lynette? Hi there. So uh, my name's Lynette Talbot. I'm joining you from Rockville, Maryland. Uh, it is just after six, but I wasn't quite prepared for the alcohol, so I've just got a cup of coffee. Um, I'm primarily, uh, my pri primary diagnosis is keratoconus. So I got tear care to help with my vision rather than strictly uh, dry eye symptoms. Um, so I'm not really using dry eye drops, but I do use a lot of uh, preservative free saline to keep my uh, scleral lenses nice and clean and free of labor. Um, yeah, so that's me. I've only really joined the community in the last year since I got my scleral lenses. So it's great to join you. Awesome, thanks Lynette. Dr. Bonnekim Schwartz is an optometrist who uses tear care in her practice. Dr. Schwartz? Yep. Um, Dr. Schwartz is very nice to meet you all. I practice in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, it's just hitting five and I just got off work. So unfortunately, I don't have a glass of wine, which would be my preference, my beverage of choice. Um, I'm just drinking water at the moment. But um, my favorite over-the-counter artificial tear is Refresh Digital. I love it. I'm a contact lens wearer. I feel like it's a great 
viscous drop for those who need a little bit of extra oil, but you know, who wear contacts. And then I also severe suffer from um, allergies. So I use Zerviant as well. So those are my two. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. Schwartz. Dr. Lowe is an ophthalmologist who also uses tear care and has been involved, I believe, in clinical trials. Dr. Lowe? Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's definitely an honor and a pleasure to get to speak to you and to the, the group. Um, it's six o'clock here in Miami. We've been having the early bands of the hurricane coming this way, so I am just still drinking some water. <laughs> but uh, um, and my favorite tier, actually, I've also been a fan of Ivisia, um, just the artificial tier, the daytime version. And I think it's been great. And I also use tear care in my practice and I've had it done on myself. All right. Thank you. Um, then Dr. Harvey is Director of Medical Affairs for Site Sciences and gets to bring us some science perspective today. Dr. Harvey? Yes. Hi. Thank you. Um, I'm thrilled to be here um, and excited about the next hour uh, that we get to share with all of you. I'm from Fort Worth, Texas, um, and uh, as she mentioned, I'm the Director of Medical Affairs, and I don't actually use drops. <laughs> all right. And finally, Jim Slunk is VP of Dry Marketing at Site Sciences. And before I let him introduce my, himself, I've got a couple things I want to mention. First of all, um, we don't do sponsored dry eye happy hour sessions. We just have guests, but I just really need to acknowledge that Site Sciences is a lead sponsor of the foundation's helpline service, which means a huge deal to us. Their generosity is making it possible for us to help more people on the helpline this year. Um, so huge thanks to them. Back to happy hour. Jim was the inspiration for today's session, and he's one of those rare and extraordinary people that I just immediately clicked with. He and I can talk ocular surface disease and dry eye community and industry re realities and issues and science and just nerd out on the insights for forever. <laughs> Jim gets also that I'm interested in substance and not infomercials, and he knows I have a ton of respect for what his company's trying to do. And I think a lot of you will be very interested to hear about that as well. Jim, over to you. You're so kind. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, you're right, though, in, in all our conversations. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to support uh, the Dry Foundation. Um, and I think it's so easy to support the Dry Foundation because we've, we've, got the, we've got a heart for the same thing, which is patient, ultimately patient care. Um, um, and I, I think a lot of people talk about that, but I, I, I think after you hear a bit of our story, and Rebecca, I, you just want me to sort of tell the site sciences story, I think at this point, um, you guys will agree. Um, so site sciences is, is um, our headquarters are in Menlo Park, California. I, I, by the way, I'm in Fort Worth, Texas as well, where it is um, a very cool for us, 96 degrees. Um, I would normally be drinking uh, a Pinot Noir, but I'm on water as well um, because I promised Rebecca I'd be well behaved on this call. So um, anyway, uh, thank you again for having uh, both Allison and I and, and just allowing us to speak a little bit about what we've got going on. Um, Site Sciences is, is uh, a company headquartered in Menlo Park, California, in the middle of um, sort of um, the, the the tech universe. Um, the entry to the company I'd spent the last 30 years in eye care was that we are a company founded by two brothers, um, um, two brothers, one of which was a cornea specialist and one of which was an NIH scientist turned financier. Ultimately, they were sitting in a meeting 10 years ago when Lipiflow was the only option out there and they were listening to some talks together, um, thinking about investment. And what they found is at the time, the number of patients that needed real help uh, was very high, yet the expense to get that real help, either as a doctor to buy the, the system or then extended to the patient was very, very expensive, out-of-pocket expense, um, that it struck them that there's got to be a better way. From a clinical perspective, the cornea specialist wanted to be as far away from the cornea with heat as humanly possible, and thus some of the things that Dr. Harvey and, and Dr. Schwartz and, and, uh, and Lowe will talk about is in, in terms of the system. But in terms of the patient care, and this is really what translates into, um, I think, our heart together, Rebecca, um, 
they wanted to make sure that the effect of any device that they were going to develop really got to the core of the issue. And we believe the core of the issue is obstructive MGD. Um, and, and then the other thing to be taken care of is, is inflammation. And there are lots of drugs and IPL and other things that would do that. But the other part, and sort of the third leg of the stool for us from day one was that this needs to be a therapy. Um, if this could be the best therapy on earth, but if no one has access to it, and what we mean by that is insured access to the therapy, that um, the world will be the same as it is today, which is only 5% of people that need the care that tier care and others could potentially provide would, would be able to get it. Um, so from day one, part of Paul Badawi's goal was um, get this product into market, make sure it works really well, which we think it does, um, and then get it insured and, and do the things necessary to make, to, to, uh, to, to, to get a, a, an insured payment for, uh, for patients to be able to get this. Because frankly, whether you're using drops, whether you're using plugs, whether you're using amniotic membranes, all of those are reimbursed in one way, shape, or form by insurance. So we knew there could be a pathway. We just had to do it. And um, the, the bottom line for us is um, we will have to show and demonstrate that we are an effective treatment. And really, by some of the work we've done and some of the work that Dr. Harvey will show today, uh, speaks to sort of what the insurers and payers expect um, in our in our proof point. So again, uh, long story short, we're a company that really um, started with two brothers loving each other and spending a lot of time together all the way through to developing in a uh, developing a therapy that addressed what a cornea specialist is worried about and sort of the heart of the company, which is making sure at the end of the day that patients can get the care that they that they need ultimately. Um, and so here we are in the market advancing toward uh, what we hope is insurance coverage for this uh, treatment in the future. And again, Dr. Harvey can talk a little bit more about the science. But again, thank you, Rebecca, for having me on. And I promised I would jump off and let the scientists and doctors do all the chatting after this. So thanks again. All right. Thank you, Jim. And I know that the idea of insurance coverage for an MGD treatment is music to many people's ears. I've got a helpline client right now on a fixed income, less than $1,000 a month going into debt for treatment. Access is a real problem. So it's just, it's very heartening to us to see efforts towards improving access to treatment. Thank you. And thank you to all of the panelists. I'm excited to get started. So let's get going. What we're going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about MGD in general. Then we're going to go on, talk about what tear care is, what it's like. We'll see a little video of it. We'll talk about its tra track record and clinical trials. And we'll talk about where it fits into the broader spectrum of treatments and um, we'll take questions too. So don't hesitate to put questions in the Q&A. Um, and to the extent we've got time at the end, we can talk through some of them. Otherwise, we'll try and answer them in, in print. All right. So first off, let's talk a little bit about MGD. Um, Mandy, I'm going to pick on you first, if you don't mind. Just talk a little bit about what MGD means to you. How'd you get diagnosed? Is it your only ocular surface disease? Or if not, where does that fit into your life? What would motivate you, in other words, to even consider a tear care treatment? So um, I think as with most dry eye patients, we are desperate to try anything and everything, um, which was part of my motivation. Um, I initially was diagnosed, as I said, with aqueous deficiency. When um, I take the Shermer's test, I produce like one millimeter in <laughs> in each eye. And, um, I have my, my, uh, tear ducts cauterized now. So maybe I have like three millimeters. I don't know. It's, it's very minimal. So initially, um, I tried a bunch of eye drops, which I still am using. Um, also at that time, I don't think there were many doctors that really distinguished between MGD and aqueous deficiency. So I was kind of told to try all the things, um, including warm compresses, which I actually still do. They, they feel good. I think as the time has progressed over 
how many years is it now? My math is working 27 years of my life that I've had this, um, at, just due to the inflammation, um, MGD is inevitably going to set in. And although it's not my main cause or what doctors look at my eye and say, oh my gosh, this is what's causing your problem. Um, completely, it is a component and I've had various um, glands that have been clogged that for years just won't come unclogged. And I've tried a few different treatments out there. And, um, the tear care was actually the first treatment that unclogged my, that, that one gland that was super capped and no one could ever get anything out. Um, I'm, clogged it and it hasn't come back now for 10 months, I don't think, which is like a miracle for me <laughs> with that one. And I mean, I know it's irritating to just have one that's con consistently clogged. Um, so, so I guess my MGD diagnosis has kind of been, um, evolving, uh, alongside my aqueous deficiency. I do a lot of research on what's, what's out there. Clearly I'm on the board. Um, I get a lot of information from other board members and um, the dry community. Uh, and I really just go out there and try everything. And insurance coverage would be awesome because everything is so expensive and it's very prohibitive for patients to seek out many different kinds of treatment if they have to shell that money out of pocket. So for sure. Thanks. Did man. that answer all the questions? I think so. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Lynette, give us a little of your MGD background. How did you learn about it and what brought you to the table here? Yeah. Okay. So um, as I said, I was uh, getting my, I have keratoconus and I was getting my scleral lenses fitted for the first time last year, uh, around this time last year, actually. And my eye doctor was just finding it very difficult to settle on a prescription. Um, he was saying, you know, your tear film is just sort of disappearing so quickly. And I was noticing that myself in just within sort of a second of, of uh, you know, the usual, which is better number one or number two question. And it was just immediately, you know, I can see it for a second and then it's just going immediately very, very blurry. Um, so he said, we get, I think we should do a dry eye workup see what's going on here um and did the sort of the imaging the eyelids inside out test which i'm sure anyone who's had a dry eye workup knows um and just said immediately yeah i pointed out we can see all of this, these blockages um and suggested that tear care would be something to to try as a first line of uh, of action to see if we could get it get those glands unblocked i was also trying the warm compresses they were maybe helping a little but um yeah this was the the first first step in a um in a treatment option a treatment plan to try and get my my eyesight as uh, as good as it could be with the scleral lenses great thank you so that's some perspective on patients in our group today of where mgd kind of fits in for them. Um, Dr. Lode and Dr. Schwerz, could you jump in here a little bit? And maybe we could just briefly talk about um, what MGD means to you in your clinical practices. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll go first. Um, MGD, as I have, you know, started treating dry eye in the last six or seven years, I have um, realized just how much it affects nearly every area of your practice. I mean, and that's what really encouraged me to make it part of a specialty that I'm really passionate about. Um, and so when it, when you realize it affects your quality of life with these <clears throat> lens wares, content lens wares, glasses, prescriptions, patients who want to get lid surgeries, um, or LASIK or cataract surgery. I mean, it is truly the core of, of my practice. And I feel that it, it really stems and affects every, everything that we do and in, in, in the quality of life that we have with our eyes. So that in a nutshell is what is what MGD means to me. Dr. Lau, I'll pass it on to you. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree with everything you said. Um, it's just become so prevalent. I think that most of my patients coming in now for visits are 
dry eye sufferers and most of them MGD sufferers along with that. Um, so I constantly looking for answers, ways to better help my patients and also help them more efficiently too. Um, because as we all know, it becomes this sort of chronic, obviously we know it's a chronic condition, but sometimes, you know, it's frustrating that the solution is not as easy and straightforward as we'd like. And definitely I hear the, the pain points of the cost to patients and practices. It's, it's tough. So I think it's, it's something uh, super important and wish I had a magic wand to wave, to fix it um, and help everyone. And I think um, as a random uh, note, Mandy, I think I met you before at one of the ophthalmology meetings. I feel like you came to the tear care booth. I, I, what- I uh, probably did. It was probably at the San Diego one. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was there with the foundation. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I don't know with your hair procedures. And I think we spoke. I'm like, you look really familiar. Your voice out. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you again, too. So I'm glad that your care has been helping you. <laughs> yeah. So that's really good. So, yeah. But I'm honored to be here. And thank you guys for inviting me to speak. So glad you're here. All right. Um, let's go ahead and move on to tear care, kind of the start of the show today. So we're going to see a little video just to see what it looks like having it done. Um, and then um, I'd like the doctors to start off this part of the session talking about what is tear care? What does it do? Um, and then towards the end of that, Mandy and Lynette can share with us what it was actually like for them. So kind of the um, clinical side and then the practical reality for patients kind of before, during, after for that. Um, Let's see. Aiden, do you have the video ready by chance? And I think Dr. Schwartz, I don't know if you wanted to say anything before we start that or just jump in when it's over. It's a pretty brief one. I'll jump in during the video. Yeah. All right, I'm ready to get it started. So here we go. So with this portion of the um, the procedure, what our technicians technically do is they clean the eyes, they prep them. Um, and then at this point, what we do is we adhere the smart lids. Then we can actually bring them to a separate room or have it done in um, the same exam chair and after a 15 minute heat application, then we do the actual digital expression that you're observing here. So this is a really good live um, example of a typical expression that you would see post-treatment. As we know. Awesome. Do we want to run through that just once more for everybody to see that close up? I kind of jumps right into the- um, Sure. I love it. Do you mind? Yeah, let's see. Sorry, is it being moody? We can just move on. Is it working? Oh. Yeah. oh, I was watching it just by myself. I had to <laughs> the share button. Okay. Okay. Share, then play. There we go. Yeah, I think how Dr. Schwartz described it is just perfect. Um, what I really like about the tear care too is the fact that it does stay external um, to the cornea, to the conjunctiva, as you can see. And, and as you can see here, um, patients can walk around which is amazing. They don't have to be stuck in one lane or they could even you know, take, look at their cell phone if they needed to really quickly, you know? Um, and then the expression part, uh, like Dr. Schwartz was saying, is, is actually really satisfying. I love being able to see the glands. And like Mandy was saying, you can actually identify if there's a gland in particular that's not functioning. Uh, and, and yeah, so it's, it's very exciting to actually see it. And then you can give feedback to the patient on how their oil actually looks. Can you speak to the comfort side of this, what is it like for somebody getting it done? What kind of feedback do you get from your patients? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I'm not sure if Dr. Schwartz has had it herself too, but I've actually um, had it performed myself several times. Um, so I can speak as a patient and um, a physician, but it's, you know, patients are very, very comfortable with it. Having the device externally 
um, you know, they, we, we put them in the room for 15 minutes, turn on the mood music, you know, really relaxing. And after they're done, they always say, wow, that felt like a spa treatment. You know, it's very soothing. Um, the heat feels good. And again, nothing's in the eye. Um, so there's nothing actually irritating the eye in the moment, but it's, it's pretty relaxing. Um, and then when you do have to go to the part where you're getting the lids expressed or the glands expressed, I do obviously use a numbing drop to help with that. And I, I warn patients, I say, look, you could feel a little discomfort, but I, because I'm with you right there and I can interact with you, if something's hurting or you feel uncomfortable, tell me right away, of course, and I can reduce the pressure that I'm applying to the glands and the lids to make the person more comfortable. I try and use enough pressure, obviously, to squeeze out the oil in order to be effective. But of course, someone, they're able to tell me instantly feedback if they don't feel comfortable. Uh, and again, myself as a patient, um, I've felt that it's very, very comfortable, the heating part and then the squeezing part, you know, like a slight pressure, you know, much like when you get maybe a, a facial done, you know, that's going to feel a little uncomfortable in some parts. But again, give feedback. And I, I find it very, very therapeutic for myself. <laughs> I'm both a, I, a patient and a doctor, you know, physician of this. I, I've received the treatment once uh, a couple months ago, and I, I do this very regularly. I do probably at least two to four a day of these treatments because, I'm, you know, I feel like um, it really does serve a purpose with my patient base. Um, I do feel that um, the first half of the treatment is, just like Dr. Lowe said, it's very comfortable. Patients often feel that that heat application is extremely tolerable. Um, the temperature is, not, is usually not too warm. In fact, some patients ask if it can go warmer. The second half of the treatment is, is the digital expression. And the way that I like to prepare patients on this type of the portion of this treatment is I like to actually squeeze the pinky side of the hand because I feel that that gives you a pretty accurate indication or ex well, expe expectation of how that expression is going to feel like along the lid margin. Um, and I do like to get an idea of their tolerance in terms of discomfort, because I do feel that at times with what I've experienced is that if a patient is severely obstructed, they are going to feel some level of mild to moderate discomfort. It's temporary. And I always tell them that it's temporary. We're always going to go at a pace that's comfortable for you. We Definitely use a prepare cane to help ease any um, discomfort at all. And I definitely wait for, I, I, I watch the patient cues very closely when I'm doing the expression to make sure that it's going to be as comfortable and tolerable as possible. Um, but it, it definitely varies based on obstruction, level of, de, you know, de, degree of severity with the MGD. And most of my patients who um, receive the treatment experience such a great relief, at least the next day or the day after, but within the next couple of weeks after the treatment's done. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Let's hear from Mandy and Lynette about what tear care has been like for them to get the treatment done. And then we're going to um, move on to Dr. Harvey and some clinical trial history there. Uh, Mandy, Lynette, whichever wants to jump in, go ahead. Lynette, you want to go first this time? Yeah, I'll go first this time. Um, so uh, I mostly agree on what's been said so far. The first part of the treatment is kind of relaxing. I was just the the heating elements were applied, and then the the technician just left me in the room with uh, you know just to to chill out really while the my eyelids were heating up. Uh, if you've used um, a heated mask or a warm compress, then it's the same kind of um, sensation. Um, goes a little bit hotter uh, because it's directly on your eyelids and is attached. Um, uh, so I think maybe it was a little bit more intense than uh, I had experience with heat on my eyes before, but it was perfectly fine. The the expression part of it got a little bit uncomfortable. Um, there's there's pressure in a in a place you're not used to having pressure. Even if you're someone who you know messes around with your eyes a lot with contact lenses or with drops, it's still a, a strange sensation. Um, and I think perhaps I have a re relatively high pain tolerance, and maybe I sort of let my doctor get a little bit more in there than I perhaps should have at times because 
for me, the worst part of it was that I felt really puffy and kind of beaten up for the next couple of days. Like my eyes just felt felt a bit sore for maybe two days afterwards. And I mean, it, it was going to be slightly unpleasant anyway, because I then couldn't wear my contact lenses for a couple of days. So just the uh, the annoyance and general discomfort if you're relying on scleral lenses and not being able to wear them for a couple of days. So yeah, that was my my experience. So if there was something you would want other patients to kind of be prepared for just in case, is that kind of what you would want to tell them? Yeah, I think I'd say, you know, there'll, there'll be a bit of, there could be a bit of discomfort afterwards and, um, but it'll go away. It's, it's a, you know, mild to moderate discomfort for, for maybe a couple of days. And maybe I'm on the, on the more extreme side of things. I only really know my own experience here. Awesome. That's why we want to hear. We <laughs> all have to get to pool our experiences. Go, go ahead, Mandy. So, um, for me, the discomfort afterwards, I'm going to start backwards a little bit, um, was not as intense. I don't know if it's because I've had dry eye for so long and early on in my, um, treatment, I used to live out East and in Boston, I would have someone express my glands in 2002, three, four, and I think maybe I'm just so used to annoyance with my eyes that now I'm just like, Oh, par for course. If it might make something better, I just still, I can like put it out of my mind and tolerate it. And so honestly, I don't think I noticed much discomfort. Um, the days after and during the expression, I'm, I've had it done so many times. So I think I went in knowing what to expect. Um, of course it was nicer with having the heat applied beforehand, um, to the extent that it was, because it makes it, I think, easier for the, the oil to flow, um, for the glands to be expressed, but yeah, it's like spa treatment, super comfortable. The first 15 minutes, um, just kind of sitting back in a chair, eyes closed and, um, and waiting for the next part. I felt felt comfortable for me the heat level was um fine for me the hotter the better <laughs> um I don't know I just maybe a psychological I feel like it's working better it's gonna gonna get that oil out um um better but I've had I had a great experience I haven't had it done since 10 months ago so I I would love to have it be something that I can get done on a more regular basis so there's again my plug for insurance <laughs> coverage and um and I mean I think that's probably really the only thing holding me back from having it done again right now so great experience overall like I said I've had many different treatments done and this this was simple um and clearly for me it was effective for my MGD Awesome. Thank you. All right. Doctors, anything more to share or we can move on to the tear care track record? I do, no, but, well, no, I, do, I do want to highlight what Lynette said about the discomfort. I think that's important for patients to know going into tear care because um, that's, you know, as you were mentioning your experience, I think for patients who haven't had a lot of treatments beforehand, and this may be one of their first or second treatments, you know, unlike Mandy's experience of doing many treatments in the past, um, those type of experiences that Lynette had, has had, I've, I've definitely um, heard from my patients so much that I do like to let them know about, hey, this, the same day. And usually just, I think because I had perhaps this occurred to me and, um, you know, the same day, your eyes are going to feel more irritated. They're going to feel drier. So they that way they walk out of the office understanding that it's not going to feel instantly better um, and setting up those expectations for, for at least the same day um, inflammation or same day irritation. And then followed by at least a couple of days of the eyes needing to um, just kind of heal back up again before they start feeling better. So I think that is something important to highlight because I, you know, for patients who don't go through a lot of treatments, um, this, it, it definitely is a different process or different experience. So 
Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I wasn't trying to downplay <laughs> that aspect of it at all. Um, I just want to make that clear. Um, and I understand from your perspective that we need to set everyone up for for <laughs> expectations and everyone is completely different. Um, every dry eye is different. Every dry eye patient is different. Everybody's pain tolerance is different. Everybody heals differently. So, so it's completely different um, for everyone. So yeah, I think um, if I can just say something um, that that seems like it's really useful to have almost two ends of the spectrum here um, that you have people who are very used to having lots of things done to their eyes and particularly dry eye treatments. And maybe it will, if you're one of those people, you'll come out of it in a better condition and feeling more comfortable than someone who is maybe having the this done for the first time. So. You know, your experience uh, will will make it feel different. I wonder, Dr. Schwartz, if you might suggest, is there any particularly effective or appropriate wording a patient can use to ask the right questions to feel really informed about what the possible short term effects might be? Yep. Yeah, yeah. um, I think have making so. I think the soreness feeling is like, how, how my eyes feel afterwards? I think it's a very common question. How will they feel afterwards? Am I going to feel instantly better? Or should I expect for there to be some, you know, window of time where um, it may not feel as good? I think that's a really good question as making sure you have realistic expectations coming from the treatment. Um, and also just being really well informed as how this treatment is going to be, how it's going to be executed. I think it's also really important. Um, the heat that Lynette also alluded to, I think it was a great thing that she mentioned because it's, it is warmer than a heat compress, which most of our MGD patients are very familiar with. I tell my patients, it feels like, it feels like you have a hot sauna on the eyelids, like a hot tub that, that, that type of heat it's warmer than a heat compress, but not so warm that you can't tolerate it. So I think just asking, you know, can you describe that heat a little more specifically and what are my expectations from this treatment and how long should I expect this treatment to last? I think are really good questions because, you know, I think Dr. Lowe kind of mentioned, kind of alluded to this, but we're not a magician. We can't just wave a treatment and then your dry is gone forever. I think a patient should understand that there's going to, there's going to be some maintenance involved with this type of process. So no, all, all great points. Um, and yeah, I also tell patients that too, like you said, Dr. Schwartz, I mean, the, the patient response the day after is variable. Like I've had some patients say they instantly feel better from their dry eye, but I've also had the opposite. And then days later, then they start feeling better for, from dry eye. So I, I also describe the experience um, in a range. Uh, so they're not worried. Um, I thought one of actually a good question that came through the chat was, um, I think Judy asked, how is this different than, um, manual expression? And then her follow-up question is, is it a 15 minute heat time? And I think if I'm understanding the correct question correctly, um, you know, the, with the tear care system, you are getting the consistent heat to the lids for 40, the 42 degrees Celsius for the 15 minutes. Um, which actually Lynette was saying, like it, she was surprised how much hotter it was than when she's done her own warm compresses. And um, I think that's the difference is that your the glands are really getting that, that con controlled consistent heat for the 15 minutes. So you're able to melt the mybum uh, better and then um, manually express it. And I, I do, I will say that I'm sure Dr. Schwartz, I'd love to hear your opinion too. The forceps provided by tear care to do the expression are, are really, really excellent. They seem to work better than other ones I've tried. I'm not sure why I'm not an engineer, but somehow they, they do work better. I, I, uh, I totally agree. I've used a few different express expression, um, take tools. And I, I always go back to the, to the clearance assistant. I think it works really, really well. So. All right. Thanks to everyone. Let's move to our third part, which is looking at the tear care history and track record and data. And uh, Dr. Harvey's got some information to walk us through here. So over to you, Dr. Harvey, for this whole section. Thank you, Rebecca. One second, everyone. Just want to make sure you can see. Oh, yikes. There we go. Okay. 
Well, it is so insightful to hear the patient side um, of not just the disease, but also the treatment. Um, and to maybe help tell the other half of the story or, or maybe the story that led us to um, the patient side, uh, I thought I would share a bit about our, our journey with tear care. Uh, and kind of walk you through uh, the clinical evolution um, of how we got from point A to, to point B. Now, some of the clinical study questions that, that we ask really align um, nicely with studies that you see published in journals. Um, and that is, uh, the first question is, does the treatment work? Um, you know, does the treatment work? How durable is it? In other words, how long does it last? Uh, how quickly does it begin working? I think that is probably one of the number one questions, right, from not just a physician perspective, but also a patient perspective. When am I going to see the benefit or feel the benefit from this? Uh, and then uh, ultimately is how does this treatment compare to other available treatments, treatments that either people have been using for a long time that maybe don't work as well, or maybe some other treatments that are quite common uh, and are working well? You know, is, is the new treatment going to be just as good, uh, if not better? So kind of think, uh, keep the schema in mind as I walk through our next slide. Um, there's a lot of text on the next slide, but I promise you I'm just going to give you um, the high points. Uh, these are just uh, the studies that we've done with tear care. Um, starting off with first, and remember that first question, does the treatment even work? So the first study was a six-month study. It was prospective. It was just done at one center, and it wanted to look at the safety and efficacy of tear care in adults with dry eye disease. And how we assessed whether or not the, the treatment was effective is we looked at an assessment known as tear breakup time, or you'll hear me refer to it as T-BUT. Um, and we looked at that assessment at baseline and then four weeks or a month after uh, the tear care treatment. Now, briefly, and our, our uh, doctors can get into more depth on this, but um, the assessment of tear breakup time, what that is looking at is after one full blink, uh, your doctor is looking at how long or how many seconds does it take before the first dry spot appears on the surface of the eye? So the lower the number, so if it's one second, two seconds, three seconds, um, it doesn't take very long, which means that your eyes are getting dry pretty quickly, right? Um, so uh, conversely, we want that number to be really high. Uh, the conclusion from this, uh, this study was that tear care was both safe and effective um, from baseline to four, uh, to four weeks. Uh, when you looked at, uh, at T-Butte, and then we compared the tear care treatment to a very common uh, uh, therapy or treatment um, that people um, have been using, which and you've heard it referred to a couple of times already, and it's called warm compresses. Uh, so in other words, tear care was just, um, was, was just as safe and was uh, actually more effective than warm compresses at um, increasing that T-Butte um, T number. The next question that, that we wanted to ask was, how durable is this effect? And if we were to do a second treatment, um, would, would the patient still be able to respond to that treatment? Um, and that's a big question. That's a big question if you're talking about a medical device or um, a pharmaceutical treatment. Um, in other words, is the treatment only gonna work the one first time you use it? Or should you need subsequent uh, treatments with it? Is the, is the patient still going to be able to respond? So what we did was we took the patients from the very first study that was in that, that first six month study, those that were on tier care, uh, and we gave them another a second tear care treatment and then followed them for an additional six months. And what we found was that uh, patients were still able to respond to a second tear care treatment. So in other words, it wasn't just one-stop shopping. You could do a second tear care treatment and they would still respond and you would still see those uh, improvements in the signs and symptoms of dry eye disease. Okay, so let's get to our next question. If we're thinking back to that, um, to that schematic is how fast does tear care work? Uh, so that's what this third study looked at. It was a prospective study um, and it was done in multiple uh, centers as opposed to our first study that was just done at one. And we wanted to, again, look at the safety and efficacy of tear care, but we also wanted to see how fast does it work. So in the previous study, our very first time point was actually two weeks um, after the first tear care treatment. So in this, uh, in this current study, we wanted to see if we look at one week post tear care treatment, do we see benefit already? And the short answer to that question is yes. And looking at that same measurement um, as the last study, the T-BUT measurement, um, we, we saw that, we, uh, that there were significant improvements um, in all patients and in all signs and symptoms of dry eye disease at one week um, post-treatment. And that 83% um, of patients' experiences were clinically meaningful in terms of their symptom relief. In other words, 
to be the most important thing is how are they actually feeling? You know, we know what you know, clinical measurements can look like, but how does it actually feel to the patient? And so 83% actually felt that it was clinically meaningful um, improvement. Okay, so then our, our next uh, chapter in the story, so to speak, um, was a study that we refer to as Olympia. And this was a very robust study. So it was a randomized uh, masked uh, control trial. And what masked just means is that one side of, uh, of the, the study, meaning the actual physicians, they were, um, I'm sorry, excuse me, not the physicians, the people that were actually doing the assessment, they were, they were not aware of what treatment the patients had. So the physicians would know whether they were um, having a tear care treatment um, or, um, or in this case, a lipoflow treatment, that was our comparator, but the people actually doing the measurements, they would not know which treatment we, uh, that, that the patient had. So um, we wanted to get at, at safety uh, and, and efficacy, but we wanted to compare uh, tear care to a very popular and effective treatment that was currently on the market by Johnson & Johnson known as the lipoflow treatment. And we looked at the mean change in that TBU assessment as well as my 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 domain concentration score or MGFS. And I know that's kind of a, a long a name for an assessment, but basically we just wanted to see how effective both treatments were at actually, again, melting that mybum and allowing um, you know, the, the quality and the quantity of, the, uh, of that mybum. What did that look like um, when, when it actually was expressed? And what we found from that study was that both treatments, tear care, uh, as well as um, our active control, in this case, lipoflow, both of them were clinically significant or showed clinically significant improvements in all the signs and symptoms of dry eye disease. And I'm gonna throw another term at you. What we wanted to show in the study, not so much was that tear care was better than lipoflow, we wanted to show that it was just as good as lipoflow. Um, so a, a term that, that we often use uh, on, in clinical development is a non-inferiority study. And so that's what we saw here is that tear care was just as good uh, as lipoflow in, in both improving signs and symptoms. Um, so I'm going to go back to our, our durability question and an independent study by um, an optometrist, uh, Tom Chester, uh, at the Cleveland Clinic. He wanted to see uh, or measure the efficacy over time of tear care. So he did up to an 18-month study. Um, he was actually looking retrospectively, so cases, people, patients he had already treated, um, and he wanted to see how long from, from the time they got a tear care treatment, how long did you see those improvements in the signs, in the signs and symptoms of dry eye disease? And what he saw was that they were able, one tear care treatment was effective at maintaining improvements in signs and symptoms for up to 12 months, and in some cases, actually up to 18 months. So now, you know, kind of doing a recap of what we know about tear care is we know it works, we know it's safe, um, we know it, you know, it, it's a very durable treatment, we know that it acts quickly, uh, and we know that it is just as good as the treatments um, that, are, that are currently out there. So this, is, this is a robust amount of information, which kind of brings us to where we are right now. So I kind of think of one of those maps you see in the mall that says you are here. Uh, and that's, that's where we are. So this last row here, um, we're, we're wrapping up a study known as the Sahara study. And largely what the study is, or why we did it, was to help gain reimbursement for tear care. So you heard Jim uh, speak to uh, reimbursement at the beginning um, of, our, of our happy hour here. And even though it's available and there's technically access, there's not, there's not access from a reimbursement perspective. And what we wanted to do was do something to help improve and increase that access for, for patients everywhere. So we met with uh, several medical directors at several managed care uh, plans and said, what do you need to see from us in order to consider um, reimbursement for, for tier care? And largely what they came back with was they wanted to see a comparison against um, a currently uh, approved and covered uh, uh, pharmaceutical treatment uh, known as Restasis, which you probably are familiar with. There actually now is a generic out there for it as well. Um, but that, that, that's what they wanted to see. That was the gold standard in their mind, and they wanted to see how we stack up uh, to, to that restasis treatment. So that's where we're, we are right now. We've actually finished the first uh, phase of that study, and we're getting ready to show results um, in the next couple of months uh, in October at the AA optometry meeting. Um, but speaking of the study, I thought I would just show you um, in a couple slides here, what that study design looks like, just to kind of give you a flavor for it. Um, I won't be able to go into uh, any results from that study just yet, um, but um, I can at least give you a little bit of a glimpse. 
And I think maybe in the interest of time, I'm going to fast forward to that slide. I had some data I was going to share, you guys, share with you guys, but I think what we will, um, we will just fast forward uh, right to the study design of that very last study I was just speaking to. So that Sahara study, um, there are two arms to the study. Uh, you have uh, one group of patients that are going to be on tear care, the other group that are going to be on, on restasis for the first six months. Then at actually at five months, those patients on tear care are going to have another tear care treatment, and we're going to actually follow them through uh, 24 months or two years. Now, looking at the restasis arm, uh, for the first six months, they will be on restasis, um, which are eye drops that, will, that they will administer twice a day. However, at six months, we are going to actually take them off restasis and put them on uh, tear care and then follow them uh, for a, a, another six months um, to, to chart their progress. So I think I will pause here and just see if there are, are any questions on anything that I have gone over uh, thus far or any comments. Um, but I do want to throw one question out there if we don't have que questions or comments, which is it's one thing, you know, to, for, for a company to run a clinical study where everything is controlled and, you know, we're optimizing for the very best results. But I think it's another thing, um, again, to hear from patients like we've heard from today, as well as uh, the doctors that we've been uh, hearing from who also participate in the trial. So, that, you know, they're, they're uh, active participants in terms of, um, you know, uh, uh, having these studies and seeing um, patients day after day, but does this translate to the clinic? And from the patient perspective, is, is what we are aiming to show in these studies, is this what you're actually experiencing when you're actually taking or having, having these treatments? So I will pause there and see if we have any questions. There's quite a few questions in the Q&A. I think most of those we're going to cover during section four and after um, um, and have Dr. Schwartz and Dr. Lowe field them. Anybody got questions specifically for Dr. Harvey and these studies? I mean, this is fascinating to me, seeing the tear care uh, study going head to head with restasis. We're going to be really, really interested to see how that um, comes out. And I had one quick question was, which was in the list of studies in the original table that you had. Give us some idea, like how many people participate in these studies? Great question. Um, so in our in the earlier studies here, in these, I would say these, these first three, we had, um, we actually had 24 in the first one and that, or, that was 12 in each group. So 12 were on tier, uh, had the tier care treatment and 12 um, had the warm compresses. Um, in the extension study of that first study, and then we just had the 12, uh, the 12 patients from that were on tier care. Um, as you move forward, we have, uh, I think we had um, 29 subjects in, in the next study, but as you get towards these, uh, these last two um, that referred to as the Olympia study, which is our randomized control trial, uh, and uh, well, eventually when we get to Sahara here, we have uh, a lot more patients. So we have uh, around 60, well, around 57, 70 patients, I believe, uh, in Olympia. And then this independent study was, was, a, was a bit smaller. And then our Sahara study, we're gonna have quite a few more patients, um, I believe around 200, uh, 200 plus patients in those studies. So when you're looking at a kind of the gold standard in clinical trials is having a randomized control study, and those typically have um, uh, many more patients than your earlier studies that are looking at, does this treatment or does this, um, you know, it does this uh, pharmaceutical or whatnot, does it even work? Those are typically much smaller studies. All right, thank you. Any other questions or comments? I think a little bit of framing that I'd love to just add for this. One of the reasons I was so interested to include this part is, um, and I'm at the risk of sounding a little cynical here, but the dry eye community is being bombarded with dry eye marketing from all sides, right? And the nature of our disease makes us vulnerable. Those of us who really cannot see comfortably any of the time. It, it's hard not to just succumb to any kind of promise of relief. And yet we have the right to ask for evidence and to expect that there is evidence that a treatment will work and that it will work for somebody reasonably similar to me. So I love to see data. I love to see well-studied treatments and that there, there is a rationale and a rationale that can 
place things in context for us. And I see from some of the questions we've got in the Q&A, that's what people are asking for is, what's the context? How does this compare with someone else? And what are the chances this actually does, does help me? So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Harvey, for covering all this for us um, and just showing us that full, that progression in history of this. No, absolutely, thank you. All right, so just looking at the time, I might rush this part ever so slightly. I don't want to keep people too long, but our next part is kind of where does tear care fit in? How is it comparing to other treatments from a patient standpoint, from a doctor standpoint? Love to kind of cover all aspects and then jump into our Q&A here. Um, and just from my own personal perspective and talking with people, I'm always fascinated to hear which one is working better for whom and why. Um, I spoke with somebody recently who had tried some MGD treatments and ended up with a preference for tear care because of some particular eye sensitivities and um, in, in, in one case, a lot of light sensitivity of just a, a lot of things I learn over time um, too about what's working for whom. I think um, Dr. Lowe, would you like to jump in here first? Yeah, no, great questions um, and great discussion too, Dr. Harvey. Um, so I think that, like you said, there are lots of different treatments available, which is a good thing. Um, but I do think, of course, the patient should have some component of myeloma and gland dysfunction uh, and evaporate, evaporative dry eye disease. So I, I am on all my patients checking um, that the oil glands, like I'll, I'll take a cotton tip applicator, Q-tip and gently press on the external part of the glands, check to see what the oil looks like, how it's expressed. Also looking at the lid margin in terms of, if, is there rosacea already? Is there irritation, inflammation? And all these things give me clues that the patient could benefit from having their glands expressed. So I think those things are a given before I consider any type of you know, heat treatment. I, the, the three big ones out there are all probably good, but I do lean towards tear care. I, I do think the comfort is better in terms of not having to put a device in the eye. Um, there is more pressure sensation than lipoflow uh, that could cause some discomfort as was discussed, but I do think it's more effective. And again, I like the feedback that I get from the procedure and then I'm able to give them my patients. So if someone really comes in wanting a certain name brand, I'm happy to do that for them. But if they come in wanting my advice, I am mostly recommending to your care because of those reasons. Hey, thank you. Dr. Schwartz, anything to add here? I think um, maybe speak to more, more to tear care versus lipoflow as well. You had a patient we were talking about the other day. Love to hear right. about that. Yes. Um, so I, yeah, we have both the lipoflow and tear care. And, um, you know, I have for a long time always stood behind managing my patients as proactive and as um, effectively as possible. So just in my setting, I work just so that way the panelists are aware. I work in a corporate setting, so I don't have a sometimes a ton of leeway, sorry. I feel like there was a lot of traffic noise. I just wanted to mute that for a second. Um, I don't have a ton of leeway in terms of what I can bring, but I, I did request the tier care once I felt like there was another option I wanted to offer in terms of price point. The light bulb went off for me in terms of efficacy for tier care when I had a, basically two back-to-back -back patients at their follow-up visits where I had a lippy flow follow-up at their one month and a tier care follow-up at their one month. And personally, I always do just a very gentle digital expression at the follow-up visit just to see how well those mybumin glands are, are working, how well they've improved. And the difference was so just remarkably different between the two. Um, and I was just, I was very shocked actually at how much more the tear care had improved this patient's MGD signs and their symptoms, they definitely felt better versus the lippy flow. You know, I, that's when the light bulb really just went off. And I thought, okay, look, tear care really does have a major role where with my patients. Um, and so I think in terms of preference, I, 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 I always want to make sure patients can handle the pressure. I think that's a given for me. 
Um, I, I, I really want them to, I always tell them, I said, this treatment, I want it to be good for you and good for me. I want you to have an experience that you can handle and tolerate and enjoy. And then I also want that to be something that I can give to you as well. So if we can come together and have an experience that you can have a great outcome from, and that's, that's all that matters at the end of the day is that you get improvement. Um, so when I have a patient that immediately makes any kind of reaction towards the pressure idea, the pressure feeling, they have a little bit of a phobia with me coming close to their eyes. Um, I do offer a secondary option with lippy flow. And I just, I just very, I just give them the facts between the two. Um, if they're severely obstructed and they want a really good outcome on their treatment, I'll say, listen, you know, I think they both can give you great options. If you can't handle the pressure, then we may want to jumpstart some of the loosening some of the blockage with lippy flow where it's a gentler type process. And then perhaps in six months, we can look at doing a tear care treatment to kind of remove some of the excess when the pressure won't be nearly as um, potentially uncomfortable for you. So I like to make sure I tailor it based on what, you know, their signs look like and, and of course what their tolerance looks like as well. So. This is so interesting um, to me. So Dr. Lowe, I was hearing you say, if I understood this right, uh, you were thinking of comfort in, for patients in terms of not having anything in the eye, just having it on the eyelid instead, right? And Dr. Schwer's about um, making sure that people can handle the pressure. Um, thinking now, just again, the, the, the context for a lot of patients right now who have been through one or more MGD treatments of some kind, one of the questions that comes to mind for me a lot is, well, I tried that thing and it didn't work, or I tried this other thing and it didn't work. Um, I think a question going through people's heads is, I spent this money, I did this thing. If that one didn't work, be it Lipaflow, IPL or whatever, is it worth me trying something else? Can you give us um, any more context you'd like to add to help people navigate that kind of decision tree of, is it worth going on and trying to your care when I've done these other things without improvement? Um, that's a great question. I mean, I think that was similar to one of the questions that was asked also in the Q&A. So it's perfect that you asked that. I, I think, you know, there is always a question if, if someone doesn't have many functioning glands, are these treatments going to help? And to go back to your question, if it didn't help the first time, could it happen, help the second time or could a different style of treatment help? I think there's still benefit to trying again. I have had patients that after the first treatment didn't feel like it necessarily helped instantly and were a little disappointed, but I actually kept encouraging them to keep doing the warm compresses. I even did help with doing manual expression um, in the office as well, repeatedly on a consistent basis. And I noticed they got better over time, at least with their symptoms. So I think that even if you've tried a treatment, something similar, it didn't seem to work, I would still be open to trying something else again, because I think there is some thought that by working on the glands, we can help improve functionality. It may not happen overnight or with one treatment. Uh, I am also a big proponent of recommending omega-3 vitamins as well to patients that, you know, to try and not only remove the, the the clogged oil, but to help replenish the current oil. So I think there's some help in that. And, you know, this is probably beyond the scope of the discussion, of course, but there's other adjunct treatments they can, that I can recommend too, that I think can help. So it is a combined effort from both patient and doctor. I, um, yeah, I just to add to that, um, there actually is a patient that I have in mind right now that I've just recently managed to seemingly felt like there was not much improvement from her tear care treatment. She's a very, she's a young patient. She's 19, just starting college, severe, obstru severe obstruction and um, atrophy of mobian glands. There's an obvious, there's an obvious um, player in terms of MGD with her dry eye. And um, she went forward with the treatment. It was a, a treatment that I felt I had to apply more pressure than normal to, in, in order to get the outcome that we were looking for. And her mother came to her follow-up visit and said, I really don't think my daughter, you know, got a good outcome from this. Um, she's still very, very dry. And so, of course, with our with our process, we do pre and post um, 
uh, objective kind of testing. So we do we do uh, interior seg images, photos of the cornea with staining, and we we take a look at those. We take a look at their um, their dry eye score. So we like to use the speed score at our practice before and after. Um, but what was so telling with this patient is that I I do like to do Shermer as well. And her Shermer scores were zero for this 19 year old, zero completely. And, but her oil expression was absolutely, was, was far more improved than actually it was, I would say that it was close to perfect as you can get from where she was at baseline, which was absolutely zero function. And so I, I had to pull away from the patient. I said, listen, okay, I understand that you don't feel that you've had improvement, but let's talk about some other things that may be, um, that may be feeding into your dry that we haven't covered yet. And so we just kind of had a more in-depth conversation about her medical health and I asked her, I said, tell me if there's anything else that you can think of that you may be dealing with that you don't even think deals with, has anything to do with dry. And after just asking her questions, she started to fill me in. I actually have, she started to use her tongue and to move it on the inside of her mouth. And she said, I actually can peel the inside of my mouth with my tongue. I really feel like I have a really severe dry mouth. And then she shows me her fingernails and she says, look at my nail beds. Is this normal for someone with really severe dry eye? And her nail beds were completely just extremely dry. It, it looked almost like psoriatic arthritis possibly, but she had no, she has no idea whether or not she has that. And so we had basically, I recommend, I recommended the patient to get blood work done, to look into her medical history more in depth. Cause I said, listen, I can't manage probably what some of your medical conditions that you may have that you're unaware of could be feeding into your dry eyes. You absolutely received a good outcome from this treatment, but that's one area that we had to manage. We've got to manage everything else. And I think it's just important for the patients to have a really good um, picture of how dry, how, so, how very much multifactorial it is. And we're managing one area and there's a lot of other areas that can really affect you. So. So, so true. All right. I'm going to jump into some of the questions in the Q and a now, and then, um, and have the, the doctors maybe respond to those, any that they choose. Um, so Kathy says, I'm currently doing, doing IPL every four months. Would tear care replace or supplement it? And how often would it need to be done? Um, so uh, yeah, I, I really actually love IPL as well. I do not have IPL in my practice, but I will refer patients out. And I think they are uh, definitely synergistic. So the, you know, again, tear care, as we know, and just discussed is heating the glands, helping uh, the clogged oil glands exit the gland and be replenished. But IPL does play a valuable role, in my opinion, with the inflammatory component, the ocular rosacea component, those angry blood vessels that we can see under the microscope at the lid margin that are probably contributing to the meibomian gland disease. Uh, so I do think that they're both valuable and synergistic. Thank you. Next on, um, someone is asking, it's kind of a double question here. Uh, what percentage of patients have no benefit as in nothing expressing and how many years of glands not working will result in no benefit? I say they I mean no benefit from treatment if their glands have been uh, unwell too long. Um, I think this is um, patient dependent. So when we are screening for patients that are eligible for tear care, we want to make sure they have structure. First off, we want to make sure that there's some, it doesn't have to be a perfect full structure, but we want to make sure there's at least some structure. In, in my case, I like to make sure they have at least, at least 20% of their structure or more. Um, and so in terms of years of glands not working, that's going to be patient dependent. Some patients can be very young and have absolute and have a lot of gland atrophy. Some patients can be a lot older that have also um, a, a, a significant amount of gland atrophy. In my opinion, when a patient has had at least, if they have at least 25% of their glands remaining on upper and lower on both eyelids, and I can see that there's that even though it's on easy expression on digital, but I can get something moving, um, then I know that they're the possibility that tear care will be a viable option for them. So percentages of patients where it doesn't work for me, I try to do a really good job of screening those patients ahead of time and making sure that they're going to be a good candidate. So I haven't had a patient yet that hasn't had zero benefit, but I, I can't speak to, you know, what other doctors have, have experienced. Great. Thank you. Valerie is asking, is saying, 
I'm worried it may make my eye drier for days or weeks after treatment since the oil is taken out. How long does it take to generate new oil? So after the expression process. My, well, my experience has shown that it takes at minimum two weeks for oil expression to start secreting from those glands and up to four weeks for, for optimal, for optimal function of those meibomian glands. So um, there is no, in terms of the eyes feeling drier after the oil is taking out, there is going to be a period where there's going to be some regeneration of function of those glands. And it's going to take probably up to uh, as long as two weeks, but may, may not, but may not take that long. Um, and that's what I tell patients is that you may feel as if your eyes are not responding to that treatment up to two weeks, but typically it's not going to take that long, but you're going to feel maximum level of improvement up to a, as soon as a month. So that was, that's what I would say that to that patient. Dr. Lowe, anything to add there? No, I, I agree with that. Um, I think that two weeks is probably a good time frame that I let the patients know that it could take for the oil to resume back to normal, but I, I don't think that everyone has to wait two weeks to feel better either. So I, I think it's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry, you know, as a patient, if you're worried that, Oh, if I'm going to be super dry for two weeks, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily true. A lot of my patients feel better in a couple of days and, and oftentimes I'll combine the treatment uh, with some post-operative drops for a while too. Like I'll, I'll oftentimes place the patient on a steroid or, you know, make sure they're still doing artificial tears and their other drops that they may already be on just to help get them through those first few days. If they're having some discomfort, I tailor it to the patient, like what Dr. Schwartz was saying. Okay, thank you. Judy is, has a safety question. She says, I've heard that too much heat on the lids can negatively affect the cornea. Is there an issue there? Um, you know, I think obviously you don't want to burn the cornea, of course, or scratch the cornea, but that could, of course, a severe burn can, can very, very uh, damage, uh, seriously damage the cornea. But with the device like tear care are these devices that are external to the lid that shouldn't happen. Uh, even in the studies that I've been part of the clinical trials, patients, uh, no one has even had a burn on their skin in the clinical trial. So the, the risk of the heat transferring to the cornea, I think would be really rare. I don't, I don't want to say non-existence because I know everything, everything in this world could be possible, but I just, I, it's not something I'm concerned about. Uh, I think that the devices that go internally into the eye for the heating procedure, the, which tear care does not, just to clarify, but there are devices that do have the applicator go inside the eye. The one thing I worry about as a clinician is scratching the cornea when placing it. And again, that doesn't happen a lot. And I certainly don't mean to worry patients. I think that, you know, with, with a careful exam, with careful application of the device, patients are fine. But I would be more worried about that than actually a thermal burn with these devices. They're very well controlled. And that's why it is important to use. I think we were talking about this the other week, Rebecca, how we want to make sure that we are using approved and proper devices in order to not have an issue. And again, tear care, you know, there's a lot of science. Actually, I was taught by the engineer and the developer of tear care that a lot of work actually went into making sure the device maintained that consistent level of heat. And I, I learned it's a little more complex than I would have thought. Yeah, just, just to add to what Dr. Lowe um, was saying, is we, we actually did do a study where um, we, we looked at what the optimal uh, temperature range, not just optimally from an efficacy standpoint, but also from a safety standpoint to make sure that we are not um, heating to a, to a temperature that's going to damage the cornea. Thank you. I think that the um, context there for a lot of us is we have done warm compresses and a lot of us will continue to do warm compresses, but talking consumer products, those temperatures are all over the map. How hot can my microwave get something if I'm not paying attention or, you know, a malfunctioning USB thing that I bought on the cheap on Amazon? Um, there's just a lot of unknowns in there. So personally, I know I take a lot of comfort from knowing there have been safety studies about temperature maintenance on uh, these things. Another just little practical question about application of it here. They're asking, does the adhesive on the device cause irritation of the delicate skin around the eyes? I have not personally seen any issues with patients having any problems with lid adhesion with the smart lids. So 
No, that's a great question too. And, and I agree with Dr. Schwartz. I haven't had that problem either. I know in the study, and of course the label for tear care just says to, for patients who have allergies to silicone adhesives, they should avoid the, the tear care device. I don't know if Dr. Harvey would have more insight on that, but I know that's on the label. But I also have not seen any problems myself. All right. I am looking at the clock here and realizing we need to go ahead and start wrapping up. I kind of, I just am really enjoying the, the Q&A part of this. I want to give Mandy and Lynette another chance here. I meant to come back to you a little bit earlier about where tear care fits in for you. Any last thoughts the two of you would like to share for people who might be considering it and just um, any summary of your experience or advice for what they should ask their doctor or things to be aware of, just your last thoughts. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll pick on you first, Lynette, and then Mandy. Okay. Um, yeah, I've found it a very positive experience. Uh, thinking back on some of the questions that have just been asked um, and some of the ones I saw in the q and I have keratoconus, I have blepharitis, I have rosacea. Um, None of those were a contraindication. I didn't have any sort of problems with irritation on my eyes afterwards, just the the irritation from the, the, the pressure. Um, I felt like I was sort of back to normal maybe a week later. That was all good. Um, and in terms of uh, choosing the treatment, um, my doctor had suggested IPL, but sort of said tear care is something with maybe fewer potential side effects, um, a, a good first line treatment, something that was cheaper um, as a first, first thing to try. And I just recently had a checkup. Um, so I am now, I think nine months after treatment and everything's looking good. He said, maybe we'll want to repeat this in the future, but at the moment we're not looking like we need another, need a repeat right now. So that's sort of where I am now. Awesome. Thank you so much for being part of this, Lynette. I really appreciate your perspectives. Mandy? I think I'm just going to stick with the should you choose this treatment uh, portion of the question because as I was saying earlier, I think everyone is different um, in their dry eye uh, disease diagnosis, uh, what is causing it, what may benefit them. For example, there are a gazillion eye drops out there, which eye drops you like um, can be very differ significantly from person to person as we um, demonstrated early on when we said, which, which eye drops are you liking the most right now? And that can change over time. So I do think it's worth trying um, all different kinds of treatments. Um, but as I said, I've tried many different ones and this is this is the one that got those that really tough one unclogged which I means that it probably worked well for the other ones um so yeah I would say go for it but also um you know keep your options open and know that the same thing doesn't work for everyone Awesome. Thanks, Mandy. I'd love for the doctors to share their last words of wisdom for us today and then cite sciences. Any last things they'd like to share? Dr. Lowe, would you like to go ahead? Sure. Thank you. Um, well, I think that, as we all know, dry eye is a journey. Uh, it's often a frustrating one for everyone involved. And, but I do think that we're really lucky in this day and age to be blessed with having a lot of new technology, whether it's procedures, drops, medications uh, that, that are coming out and there's a lot of research behind it. So I think that we're getting closer and closer to being able to help treat patients. So I, I do wanna be encouraging. It definitely can be stressful at times for both doctors and patients. But again, I, th I think that we're moving in the right direction. And I would just say, find a doctor that you trust and feel like you have a rapport with because, of, you know, again, it's a journey. <laughs> so. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. Dr. Schweiss? Uh, I just want to second what Dr. Lowe said. It, it absolutely is a journey. It's something that you have to be very committed to in order to be able to um, always um, see the improvement, see the progress that you're looking for in terms of feeling better, seeing better. Um, you know, you, 
you have to have your, you have to play your part as a patient in order to make sure that you're doing the things that you need to do um, with what your doctor's recommending to you in order to um, have the best, longest outcomes with whatever procedure or treatment you decide to go for. Do your research, ask really good. I think the questions in the panel, I, I feel um, Rebecca's pains. I think that it, these are some great questions, but um, find, you know, find that doctor who's so dedicated to your health that they'll do anything and that they'll answer any questions truthfully. Um, and, you know, just good luck to everyone out there who's been suffering from this. I think um, we do live at a time where we have some great things that we can do. So, um, you know, thanks again for allowing me to be a part of this. Thank you so much. Gosh, I just appreciate everyone who's poured into this today so much. I, uh, Dr. Harvey and Jim, I think I'm going to leave the last bit with you you here to summarize what you would last want to share with us. Uh, I don't think there's, there's, there's really much to share. I will thank you again, Rebecca, for the opportunity for Allison to share the science and for us to spend the time. And I think the, 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 and thank Dr. Lowe and Dr. Schwartz. I think what Dr. Lowe and Dr. Schwartz um, exemplify are uh, if you're not getting the answers or you're not satisfied in the conversation you're having with your docs, find a new doc. The, these these are two real pearls in terms of there are docs out there that care that care deeply about what you're dealing with um, and what you deal with every day. It was a pleasure to hear from um, Amanda and and Lynette because we seldom hear the voice of the patient, but it's been a real pleasure to hear you guys and and to speak to you guys tonight. But I mean that that's my one point, if, if you are not satisfied as a patient, I can tell you some, as someone that has been around eye care for over 30 years, there are a lot of great docs like Dr. Schwartz in Birmingham and Dr. Lowe in Miami. They're not the only ones. There are tons of really great docs. And if people aren't empathetic with you, there is someone that cares more down the street. Um, and, uh, and again, thanks again, Rebecca, um, for the opportunity to, uh, to uh, to participate and to support, um, you know, a really uh, great initiative. And um, again, thanks for for everyone for sitting through this tonight. And I hope we brought something to the uh, to the party, as they say. So thanks, Rebecca and team, Aiden. Thank you, everybody. I have learned a ton. Thanks for taking the time. Um, just really appreciate you all, and hope to uh, see everyone again in the near future. Wishing everybody a good night. We do have a last, some last few questions in the Q&A. I just, we're going to sum up some things with the video when we post it on YouTube. So thanks everyone. Thank and you. Have a great night. Good evening. Thank you Thank everyone. You.